Hey, everybody, we've got Travis Rohr with C3 Project Pros, a community that teaches you how to demystify the construction process, regardless of your skill set. We dive into equity rentership and how this can break the poverty cycle. He shares with us his TMT, time, money, team method, and how it can return $40,000 to your project. Check it out. Hey, hey, everybody. Welcome back to the show. I'm Brandon Straza, and I believe that life gives to the givers. And today, we've got Travis Rohr of C3 Project Pros to help you lead with the give. Travis, welcome to the show, man. Hey, Brandon. How you doing, bud? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. Hey, real quick. I always like to get this one out in the beginning. Um, if someone's looking to connect with you outside of the podcast, outside of the give that you're, gonna, that you're going to be giving at the mm -hmm. end of the show, um, would love for them to know how to connect with you externally. Well, the email the easiest way is email and it's Travis at C3 project pros.com. All right, there you go. If you want to reach out to Travis and what he's bringing to the table, definitely reach out to him there. And then remember at the end of the show, we're going to tease his give and, or his gift and where you can find that inside of TSF. So, all right, man, you know, our ability to learn or our availability of information has really changed over the last two to three years. Mm -hmm. In our younger years, it was textbooks and teachers, friends and family, beyond the Googles, the YouTubes, and you know the other search engines. How has your learning changed from your early years versus today? Oh, well, that's crazy. Well, I, and funny thing is, I'll go back to learning. You know, post high school, I immediately went into the military, and then I and there you're beat with a stick to learn. Um, and not literally, but you know, think, you know. Anyway, you, you have a different learning path in there because it's all textbook manuals, their their technical training manual. And if you can believe it, I worked on the nuclear missiles and the and, and the uh, ICBMs. That's that was my job in there. I did um the support systems for the ICBMs. That's what I that's what my job was. I don't think you ever knew that, obviously by the look on your face. I I've I've got to sit there and say this. Like Travis and I have a previous relationship. Uh he he's partners with me on a couple different things, but like I had zero clue that like, you know, you had ICBM. Like I haven't heard that word in quite some time. Yeah, so I my, one of my scary stories early on was um I was down on the bottom of the of the silo actually doing a test on a, on a pump that was in the bottom. I'm down there and they have to do these cone tests. So, picture you're at the bottom of a silo with a missile above your head and next thing you, know, you start hearing this mechanical thing you look up and the cones are literally moving and you're just like it's gonna be quick <laughs> you know, it's a little spooky we got our work done and we got the hell out of there anyway that was that that was that funky day but gotcha uh, i mean like i don't even know where to go with that and i'm trying to sit here remember like we we went from learning to icbms and like where you were <laughs> Yeah, so the, so, so our learning course, started in a so our learning has started from a missile silo, and now Travis no longer sits in a missile silo with his little lunch pail. Yeah, what are you doing today? Uh, well, um, I am assisting people help. I'm helping people as best I can navigate the complex world of flipping houses. There you go. Uh, and how is how is that learning really like implemented again back from the silo to how you're learning today? Okay, so my young, my younger days, like my dad was a. Uh, pseudo contractor guy my grandfather was a contractor and a really fine finished carpenter so i i was from the age of 12 through my time in the military i was job site guy clean up etc cetera, etc cetera. so i learned to be around construction it just kind of was a natural fallback well i ended up during post military getting a job um during the day uh, as a con, as a carpenter guy, started off as the, you know, the grunt working up to lead carp carpenter foreman project manager on various projects while I was going to college. So I was my degrees from Montana state university. Um, and while I was doing this, I thought I was going to go get a real job. So my, my last year of college, I ended, uh, I ended up getting my own contract contracting license, I ended up landing some custom homes. Next thing you know, I've got employees. Next thing you know, I got 10 employees all the way up to, I think at my peak, I had 65 employees doing all kinds of work. And it was a big job, big task, and there's a complexity to it. So to get back to your question of how do I help people during all that time and processes in, 
even taking, you know, catapulting the military thing. Everything has a system, everything has a process. And, uh, I believe in a system and a process and, and, and efficiencies. So that's how we worked our construction crews and that's how they worked. And, and, uh, we were able to produce good projects. Well, out of that came what I'll call my system, which is, you know, streamlining efforts, proper scheduling, proper project management, proper coordination. And out of that, I just wrote a, I wrote a program and this is how I do it. And it translates perfectly to house flips. I actually have a whole program written for how to generate your own house, but that's just, there's a lot more to it. And it's, people don't want that undertaking. It's big. Well, house flipping has turned into a really big, big industry. It's several billion dollars in the year and that in the world annually in our, in our country annually. And what I've seen out there, which is where I fit in is I see people out there and you got the two big names, you know, Ryan and Jerry, but they teach people how to find them and sell them. The project management piece in the middle is where you're going to, I don't care if you, I don't care if you bought the best property on the planet. If you don't know how to do that middle section, you're going to lose money. So let's capitalize on that. That's where my mindset came in is like, you don't have to be an experienced craftsperson. I happen to be a skilled carpenter. You don't have to be that to do what I'm teaching. All you got to do is follow this plan, follow the project, build a project plan and follow it. Very so simple. I can tell you, I, I could have used this and I'm being sincere in this. We redid our house uh, six years ago or so. And we had the contractor and then we had the main person, you know, that was here. And then we had me and I was the board. I, I was the person between my wife, our general contractor and the main guys that were here. And I was the person that was here seven days a week, not the GC. Mm -hmm. And it was three and a half months to gut a house. Um, I did it to say the least. Like if you saw like what I was involved with, you'd be like, ah. you know, I, I'm, you know, it's, it's, it's not unimpressive to say the least. But I can tell you, it probably would have gone a lot smoother, less arguments, easier communication, and how to go, you know, how to actually go through those pieces right there. But needless to say, we came out alive. We don't talk to some of the people that were involved with the project anymore. Let's leave it with that. But that, that's interesting. I never knew some of that stuff. You know, well, here's, a, and, here's, a funny, here's a funny piece. I got a family member that's stubborn as hell. And she likes to fancy herself as being her own project manager. And she's done lots of renovations on their place. And I talk about the process. And I'm like, anytime you need help, give me a call. And she refuses to ask me for help, whatever, for whatever reason. So finally, i talking to her one day and she's going off about this one problem she's having and going off about how much they quoted her. And I said, Linda, I know, didn't mean to say her name. I'm like, I know you don't want. <laughs> Not I, Linda. Yeah. Yeah. I know you don't want my help. You've said that repeatedly. I'm just going to send you my document. One of the ones that I've actually included in this. I want you to read it and then ask me one question off the document. I'm going to help you. She, she called me two days later. She goes, thank you very much. I followed that thing. I took your advice and she saved herself like 40,000 bucks with one phone call. Yeah. And I'm like, there yeah. you go. Job well, is done here. That is it. How, how has her learning changed? She went to her resources and I'm, right. you know. Enough said right there. You know what I mean? As an entrepreneur, it's easy for us to lose our footing, mm -hmm. you know, lose our confidence and second guess decisions that we're making along the way. How have you developed a winning mindset and what are some of the techniques or practices that you use to overcome self-doubt or limiting beliefs along the way on the project? Well, um, on, on which project? Any project. I mean, like just what you do. Well, I got to tell you, that's, you know, there's... <laughs> The, the beauty lies in, like, I'll use a statement that you say, you never step in the same river twice. I learned that not long ago from a, from a trusted friend. And that would be you. And it's interesting when you hear information for the first time, it's like, oh, it might have an impact. And you hear it a second time. It might take somebody, you know, first time they get the oh, wow moment, the aha, the light bulb, whatever you want to call it, you know, that nugget of gold. And it, so the learning never changes. And Scarcity mindset is something that I was guilty of. I didn't want to give up too information, too much information early. Didn't want to be overly helpful. Please come to me for the resources. It's like, you know, here's the resources. Call me when you need a hand. And because at the end of the day, you can have, I mean, I'm surrounded by books here in my office now. Do I read them all? No, but they're there. You know, so it depends on 
it's hard to land my plane on, on your question specifically because my learning path has changed so much and it's more now experiential with people that I surround myself with. Um, people like yourself and, and the success finder community and just how giving and helpful and, you know, honestly, wonderful, that lack of scarcity mindset, the abundance mindset is, is, uh, I think key to the success of anybody. I mean, get rid of that blockade of your own head. Yeah. I mean, I think you, you've lived it, you've seen it and all from like a cab ride, you know? Oh yeah. There's nothing to hide. Like, yeah. The resources that you've seen and how we lead with the give is the way that you lead with the give. It's just like, here, have it. The thing is, here's the differentiator. And this is for anyone that's listening right now. So many people don't do anything with it. They've Mm -hmm. been given the resources. They've been gifted the resources. The book is open. Here you go. And we'll help you with it. Are you going to take the idea off the shelf and actually implement it? Action begets action. Yeah. Yeah. And well, that's would, the first step. Well, and I would say even on in my young co- contractor days, and you know, whether your material takeoff is off or something, and I learned something very valuable. I my my building career started in Montana, and it was interesting. Our lumberyard that we went to was like Cheers. We'd have our morning coffee down there. You'd walk in and you'd give each other crap, and it was communal. It wasn't like even though you're they're your competition, and you knew who your main competition was. You know, they were there to help you. And a lot of times, Montana's it's a big state, but the developments are small and we'd be working next door to say, you, you, my main competition. Like I recall a story with one of my main competitors back then, his name was Lee. And we were building like, I think he was across the street, caddy corn, whatever, who cares in the same neighborhood as me. I was working on Saturday and I was some sheet goods and some studs shy of finishing a task I needed to do. I literally texted him. I'm robbing some material from your job site. I'll have it delivered on Monday. He's like, no worries. So it was, I mean, even he was my competitor, but it was like, we had that communal relationship. We just wanted to help each other out. You know, he's over there setting trusses and needed a hand for a couple, you know, a couple hours. So my guys would run over and help him. It was, it was a very, I, so I've been around that abundance mentality and I just, mm. I didn't even recognize it. It's funny. That story just came to my mind just now. And I've been around that abundance mentality and helpful mentality from the beginning. And there's, you know, there was period, there was a phase of your life where it's like, I'm selfish and it's mine. So yeah. that, that, I, I love hearing that. And then I, the, the cheers, the cheers reference. I'm sitting there and all I can hear is you want to go where everybody. Knows. Oh, so I'm, I'm even off key on that one. Yeah. You want to go where everybody knows your name. Yeah. I have lots uh, of stories for that. We'll talk. Off yeah. We'll, we'll save that one for the next day you know, for the <laughs> after hours episode, you know? Yeah. And, and, and with what you do, I got to imagine remaining nimble and being able to adapt quickly is is key to success what are the tools you use to work through change uncertainty or disruption as it's happening in real time and you just kind of gave us one but i'd love to hear another example well okay for example real time i'm in i'm in the middle right now of negotiating a a, i'm still an active builder from time to time i from time to time and i'm in the i'm in the process right now of like i'm leaving next week to go to hawaii for a few days to set up a project for a friend of mine. And then I come back and I'm also negotiating a dental clinic. And now it's the same people I've worked for before, but I'm, um, I have a, I have an expertise in building dental clinics. It just kind of happened and I've done three of them. And this guy wants to expand his previous client. So to, to land my plane on that is okay. Today's world has changed post pandemic with material supplies, availability, procurement is my biggest challenge. And I hear time and time again from people that are like, well, I can't do this because now it's that, meaning lead times or whatever. And so my biggest obstacle is you've got to prepare yourself for what the new knowns are, not rely on old information. I mean, you're refreshing your book, right? You're tearing out that page and starting a new one. So for example, I know that windows that I used to be able to procure in six weeks sometimes are now 24 weeks. Mm. depending on your build, depending on your projects, t- six to 24 weeks is a big, big deal, especially when you're plugging a hole in a building. So it's really doing, and this is what I have preached from the beginning and I beat it up in my, in my program, pre-construction phase is key. You build the project on paper, start to finish before you pound, before you put the shovel in the ground. It, it's imperative. 
You better know every detail, every aspect of your project. I don't care what it is. And if it's a flip, and I got a, I got a guy I personally coach and he lives in Charleston and he's a responsatory kind of guy. Well, this came up. Now I got to deal with that, but it's three weeks out. I have shown him on two, two flips that he's done where he was taking a flip from six to nine months to do it. And now he's doing it in two and a half to three months. Now in today's world, I mean, you know, the, you know, finance. Can you imagine the difference of a project hold time opened, excuse me, open meaning under construction, a project open time of three months to nine months. What would six months do in the last year in the, in your interest cost? And as you know, when the interest starts to rise, so guess what happens then? Not only do your profits get diminished because your carry costs are so high, your target market for who you can sell to diminishes because their buying power is shrinking. So you've got two negatives happening, accelerating that decline and your bottom line profit really fast. If you can shave that much time off project, I mean, so I focus on three things, time, time, money, and team, those three things only. It applies to your industry. It doesn't matter what it is. It's like, you can have three things, what speed, quality, or, or uh, what is it? Speed, cost, and quality. You can't have all three. So I think we get another yeah. song in there called TMT. It's TMT, oi. It's Travis's ride. It's TMT, oh oi. Yeah. So, I don't know, that might be copyrighted right there. Yeah. So at the end of the day, Brent, it comes down to the front, the pre construction phase. And I think that, I mean, I, I truly believe that there's so many people that, you know, they're spoiled because the industry was good post 2007, 8. They came on, construction market's been going crazy. They've not been through a downturn. I lived through 2007, 8. I survived that mess. I mean, we got another big downturn coming in 2024. It's what it's predicting like in the housing market specifically, especially with rates and just availability of funds. People are locked into low interest rates. So why would they swap it out to a more expensive house? So otherwise people that would be moving are sitting. Yeah. So at the end of the day, it's like, I think the flip market is still really strong and good because there's going to be deals that have to be had, but you need to be able to maximize your you need to be able to maximize your project value by collapsing time, by taking that extra month. I don't care if you, it might seem ludicrous, but don't start the juice running on your construction loan until you're ready, until you know everything is ready to go. Because the minute you have a delay, your carry costs will just eat you up. So that's, yeah. that's why I, uh, you'll get squeezed out. Yeah. Have the thing. Yeah. I mean, in, you know, when, when someone's looking to invest in their future, so then what you're talking about is literally investing in their future. Mm -hmm. They usually have a better than vague idea of what they're going to get. You know, wh what were, they're, they're able to have expectations on the people that they're going to surround themselves. So in your case, contractors or different individuals from there. What should people expect when they enter your reality and work with you or your program that you've got? Um, a time-tested, proven system that works. And, and I say that with confidence, um, I, the, maybe your audience probably doesn't know, but I used to, my last five years and I was really, really active in construction. Um, I went crazy and got licenses in 10 States. I worked all over, including Hawaii. So it was, you know, primarily Western region, Montana, Idaho, Oregon, Washington, California, New Mexico, Utah, Arizona, Hawaii, and did work in all these places. So my point to bringing up that location isn't because I was cool. It was because we reached for a bigger vision of what we were going to be. And in doing so, we had to rely on teams that we were unfamiliar with. So mm -hmm. we had to learn how to vet, first of all, pick, explain what our, what their job was to be, um, vet their scope, vet them as a person. And as I say in the programs, I say, I don't care if the referral came from your mother. You vet them. And if it feels funny, get rid of them. It's because they have to buy the jive with you, not your mother. Right. Mm -hmm. So I, I teach you how to build teams. I teach you how to find supplies, I teach you how to source product, teach you how to schedule, teach you how to budget. And then the, the worst person, once you've done all that, your, your biggest enemy is yourself because you might, you might be into a flip. Let's just. Let's get, let's get back to that for a second. Let's say you bought a gold mine flip. I mean, a property that's not too trashed or whatever in a neighborhood that there's a big upside to it. So let's just say the neighborhood value is 350 average, and you were able to buy this property for 
150. I do explain a buy box in my program on what the rules would be and here's how you determine. So let's say you've got this massive upside. Now let's say you've got a plan, you've got a schedule, you got a budget, you got your products, you've got your team, you're ready to go and you get into it and you're like, wow, this would be cool if we just did these few extra things. What do they call them? Not, not light on What do they call that when you add on? Change uh, orders. Change orders. There we go. Uh, and there's a, and I'm, I'm going to dispel that myth immediately. People are like, oh, contractors love change orders. I'm going to be the first one to say crap on that. We do not. I do not. Simply because it disrupts my schedule and my flow for all my other projects. Because let's just say you have other projects that are next to it. Well, if I'm delaying this one because I've added a scope of work, now I'm delayed. It's just, it's a snowball. The you pump the can down. I just, it's terrible. So, um, of course there's changes that happen. If you open up a wall and there's complete rot and it's like, wow, unforeseen conditions happen. They do. We're not, we're not Superman. We don't have x-ray vision, but you, you, you can predict a lot of that. As a matter of fact, I've done some video walkthrough with people. My, my guy in South Carolina, I'll still do video walkthroughs with him. He's like, what do you think about this, this, and this? Well, based on what I've seen, that could be a possibility. You just don't know. Right. So you can do a lot of predictive assumptions when it comes to that. So I think I answered your question. No, absolutely. I mean, I'm, I'm learning so much from the aspect of what I didn't know. I didn't know. And I might know a little more than the average bear just because I've, I've lived it. I've done it, but I can see all the pitfalls that come along with it. I think our, our biggest one was a, a 40,000 boo boo when it comes to, came to some structural stuff that we hadn't planned for because we didn't know, but. Right. It is what it is. You know, you know, there's always new ideas brewing in times of prosperity, like yes. money's flowing. Everyone's just like they're, they're digging life. But I believe that that creativity and ingenuity come out of times when we feel the squeeze. What are you working on right now that's going to take place over the next 12 months that excites you? Well, um, as you know, I'm helping Laura with her thing. <laughs> but what, what's really exciting me is... Um, I have two projects specifically that I'm working on. I'm trying to, I'm trying to uh, gather some interest. No, this is outside of house flipping. Um, so one, continuing my house flipping thing. And two, I have an active project that we're getting ready to kickstart with this dental renovation. It's a three month project for me. And I just like working for the guys. It's a pediatric clinic mm. and it's a lot of fun. It looks like a rainforest cafe when I'm done. I remember the first time I worked on one, I thought it was kind of silly because I came from a, historical renovation and a high-end construction. So everything was fine details, quality product to go to something where I'm screwing fake lizards and geckos to the wall. So it was a mind shift for me, but then once I did it, it was fun. So then to answer your question is, uh, I would like to get into more of a co-op housing scenario where create, create an exit plan of poverty and a generation of owners. Okay, you're gonna you, you got to go deeper on this one because there's a lot more to this. Oh, it's it's, you, a, big, it's a big big project. Get, give give the listeners and myself like what is this really right here? What is this passion right here? Because when when I hear someone that leads with the give that has this passion in it, you just you didn't even scratch the surface. You got to go deeper on this for me, man. Okay, so early on in my construction career, I was a sustainability. I have all these sustainability tags on me. Like I'm a lead professional, sustainable building advisor, and an energy star verifier for buildings. I have that training and that expertise for building science. As a result of that, I ended up getting to work on a project in Washington and it was co-op housing. And so it's an, it's a sweat equity type project where you, the owners would then come in. It's typically lower in, lower income owners come in and with some sweat equity, they get ownership in their building. So it's, it's a path to it's a path to provide equity in one generation. And as we know, real estate is the biggest source of wealth distribution and asset in America. Well, if we can change that model up, not just single family homes, but because we do multifamily renovation and investing, we could find, because and especially right now over the next four years, because of the flood of money that's on the market at high interest rates, this floating rate loans, there's properties left and right being taken back by the bank that they're going to be available at a big discount. Now, this is a much bigger type type of project, right? So we're talking, we need capital investors and people that have a social mind and people that are patient, meaning slower return and lower rates. By doing so, we can renovate properties 
and take this lower income class. And as a result of not just rent, but have it contribute to equity rentership and have them a path forward to where the next time they move, maybe they can do a single family home. Maybe they can pass that down to their kid. Trying to break this poverty cycle in a single generation would be a, be a really cool thing to be a part of. I, I'm typing this out because the equity rentership breaking the poverty cycle is just, I mean, it's, it's right there. I yeah. wrote a blog on it. I'll, I'll put it in the gift. Yeah, absolutely, man. I'm, thank you for going a little bit deeper because there's so much more behind that, that you get the right individuals and the right people, which it's coming. Mm -hmm. It's, it's, it's able to help change the world. You know, it's, well, it's, one property at a time. And, and because yeah. of my experience, with the hotel and resort work that I did remotely to be able to build these teams remotely and mass produce this work. And I say it like that only because you don't want to have a ridiculous long open time. You build the right team. You have the right investment. So it's time, money, team. I don't want to have a property that's going to take five years to eventually improve. You got to get in because these properties that are distressed are empty and you can't have an empty project, you know, it, whether it's half empty, they have to be able to be flipped and habitable quickly. Otherwise you've, you've lost the impact because the carry costs are going to eat up that potential equity for the renter. Yeah, man, I'm, I'm loving this. And as, as we get ready to come to a close here. And there's so much, I'm already thinking of people that I'm like, ah, I've got to have them listen to this episode. And it's not just because it's, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's our podcast. I'm already thinking of people that I just want them to hear because they're going to hear something that I didn't. And then we're like, Ooh, I need to connect Travis to this person. And I'm thinking of a person that's in Hawaii already and a few other things, but I'm looking forward to that one. All right. Last one for you. You know, mm -hmm. I've, always believed in leading with the give mentality. It's the principle on which I've based every company I've built, partnership. And uncoincidentally, it's the name of the podcast, The Give. We ask every guest on the podcast to share a little sneak peek of what their give will be for our listeners placed over at TSF. So Travis, what have you brought today to give to the listeners? So today um, I brought, I put the write-up the description of how I build a team. And that's what I did in all these remote locations. And it was never failed. That's exactly, I wrote it, run out exactly step-by-step step who I start with, how I end it, how I build my team. So that's in there. And then I've included the entire PDF catalog of checklists for every phase of your fist, uh, of your flip, including product checklists. And if somebody has any questions, feel free to reach out at Travis at c3projectpros.com. And I'm happy to answer questions. I'm happy to get you on the community. I have a free AMA section in there, which is ask me anything. And I, I answer for some pretty obscure questions in there. And then I'll also throw in that equity rentership um, blog I wrote last month on what I'm, what my thinking um, in that process would be. Cause I think it's a, I, it's, it's a passion project and it's just it's slow. It's a passion project, but it's a game changer. I mean, that's that's the reality. There's nothing else other than seeing that it can be a game changer. And in the world that we continue to grow into, we've got to lead with the give. And yep. we have had Travis Roar with C3 Project Pros. Travis, thank you so much for your give. Thank you for being here today and uh, just appreciate your time. Thanks for having me, Brandon. I always appreciate it.